Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Center. Turn to your neighbor and say, welcome. Glad you're here. Turn to your other neighbor and say, yeah, I'm glad you're here, too. My name is Steve. If I haven't had the honor of meeting you yet, um, just one of the pastors here at Christ Center and so thrilled that you would join us for a few moments today. We certainly don't take it for granted that you're here. Um, we also want to welcome all of those online that are watching and just encourage you to type something in the chat just so we can connect with you. We're in a, um, we're in a new series that we're going to highlight a little bit later, but before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been stuck between two places? Right smack in the middle of two different spots. In other words, have you ever found yourself wanting to travel somewhere and you are stuck in the airport for hours? Anyone in here ever have that happen to you? Or on, even worse, on the tarmac as they're fixing the plane, right? It's no fun. I remember my son and I, my youngest son, Eli, and I were going to travel to the state basketball tourna tournament in Yakima. And um, it, was not, it was at night. I got off work and we took off and we go through Ellensburg and we're coming up the, the hill outside of Ellensburg to head to Yakima. And we get almost all the way up the hill and then a billow of smoke just starts coming out of the car. And I have a Subaru, so there's two words that come to mind, head gasket. And, um, and sure enough, that's what it was. And there we were, stuck on the side of the highway, semi-trucks just whizzing by us. And every time they go by, you can just feel the car shake. We are not where we were. We're not home. And we're not where we want to be. We're stuck in the middle. And we're in a series called The Land Between. And the land between is a place that can be unstable, just like in that car. Every time a semi-truck went by, it would shake. And then we wanted to get out, but it was in the winter, and it was cold, and so we would go back and forth because the land in between is also a land of change. It's unstable. It's full of change. And change was happening rapidly before the pandemic, but it seems as though change is happening at lightning speed right now. Change in politics, change in technology, change in global order, change in our culture. And all of these changes give us a sense of uneasiness, a sense of where am I? Black and white is harder to find, and let's face it, it is difficult to live in the land between here and there. Uneasiness, conflict, we are not where we were, and we have not yet arrived where we are going. You see, the land between is a space that exists between two realities, the passing season and the future. But somewhere in the middle is the land between. Maybe you know this space as a gray zone. Maybe you have called it a desert or wilderness. Maybe you've wor used words like the, the, the saints of old, dark night of the soul. Maybe you call it walking through the storm. It's where you've lost your job. It's where maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you have lost a friendship. A friend has abandoned you. Maybe you have a chronic illness that you cannot seem to get answers. Maybe it is a place for you that is full of 
doubt and fear and frustration. Maybe it's after you leave high school and you wonder where you're going to go to school and you're not sure. Or maybe it's when you finish college and you're trying to find a job. Maybe it's the place where you lose your job or maybe it's a place where the finances aren't coming. It's the land between. You're not where you were, and you're not where you're going to be. The land between is often cloudy and sometimes hauntingly quiet. The land between is full of roadblocks and detours and speed bumps and darkness and clouds and fog. The language of the land between has language like, how long until this passes? How much more do I have to endure? God, are you out there? And if ever there was a land between, it was a season with the children of Israel after they left Egypt. Now, they were enslaved in Egypt under bondage, and God heard their cries. They kept crying out, Lord, deliver us, free us, set us free. And God did that. He set them free. They now left this past behind and were going somewhere different. They were going to a future, the promised land, Canaan. But sadly, they had to go through the land between the two. And there's no way out or around the land between. There is only a way through it. And Numbers chapter 11 is going to be kind of our ground zero today. If you want to turn there in, in your Bibles or on your phones or your app or whatever you have, we'll also have it up here on the screen. But what we see is we see a people that ever since they left Egypt, they complained. They griped. They muttered. They grumbled. And Numbers 11 finds them three days outside of Mount Sinai, where they had crafted a golden calf to worship. Three days after God had delivered the law, three days later, the scriptures record what the children of Israel had been complaining about. So let's take a look at the scriptures in number 11, starting in verse, uh, verse 1 of number 11, Numbers 11. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Let's back that up just a minute. Now the people, what? Complained about their hardship in the hearing of the Lord. They didn't complain to the Lord. He just heard them. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that the place was called Tabara because fire from the Lord burned among them. The crowd, being the non-Israelites who followed them out of Egypt, there were those who were not Israelites that chose to follow them. They began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. You see, the 
land between is fertile soil for things to grow. We have a, a garden out here. And every year we work really hard at this garden to make it so that we can grow flowers and vegetables. And we work very hard at it. The land between is already very fertile for some things to grow. And one of the things that grows so easy is complaining. And I want to say this morning that there are two types of complaining. There is evil complaining, and then there's good complaining. Evil complaining, also called grumbling, is forbidden in the Bible. The scriptures actually say, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Evil complaining. I remember several years ago when I just had been a youth pastor for a few years, and for whatever reason, the, the tithes and offerings dried up in the church. And a decision was made that I would need to go to part-time. And it was rough because I still had bills to pay, so I took on a few other jobs. I did some, I was a, a waiter, I was a beverage cart operator, I was a t-shirt maker, and I was an EMT. And I remember trying to do all these things and juggle all these things and, and, and pay our bills. And I remember that there arose in me a sense of complaining. And by the way, I just want to stop and say, thank you, Christ Center, for being so faithful in your giving and your tithes. It is why we can support missionaries like James and Valia and their family. It's why we can support the Robertsons. It's why we can support the Reockers. It's why we can support Brian Payne and others. It is because of your faithfulness. But in this season, I was in the land between. And I didn't know how long I could sustain it. And I remember getting frustrated that I was still trying to do youth ministry, which I knew God called me to do, but I, was, I had all these other jobs. And I, I allowed a spirit of complaining to come over me. And there was a church in the Seattle area that reached out to me. They knew that I was part-time, and they said, we'd love to hire you at twice the salary. Oh, I was so tempted. <laughs> Except for one thing. God had not released me from Christ Center or the Wenatchee Valley. Something may sound really good, but if God's not called you to it, it's a waste of time. But I wanted to. I wanted to leave. I wanted it to be easier because I hated the land between. And yet, there were things I needed to learn in the land between. But the reason that it is so dangerous, evil complaining, is because it's so contagious. You see, once I started complaining, it was easier for Stephanie to complain. And on and on. Complaining, evil complaining is contagious. It started, remember, it started with those that followed the children of Israel out, and it spread. That's what complaining does. That's what grumbling does, is it spreads. And thankfully, the Lord wouldn't release me from Kashmir. And that was probably 25, 26, 27 years ago. And I think, what if I'm out of the land between? You see, the land between is also where God forms us and shapes us. But if we allow evil complaining to be a part of our lives, then it's harder for the good things to grow, right? 
Because when you have so many bad things growing, where is the room for the good things? You see, the ones who followed the Israelites out of Egypt had a craving, and soon they had the people of Israel whining, why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it for free. Emotions are incredibly contagious. There was a study done um, several years ago, and all the study was, they brought in some people that had marked down that they were depressed. And they sat them in these rooms, and then they brought in people that were happy. And all they told the people that were happy was, just stare into the face of the person sitting next to you. They didn't know anything about this person. And so they just sat there, and for five minutes, they just stared into their face. And to the person, the people that walked out of there that came in happy were depressed. Emotions are contagious. Complaining is contagious. Evil complaining is also destructive because it causes amnesia. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it for free. Who was it that was asking God to deliver them out of Egypt? Who was that? It was them. The children of Israel were begging God, release us, release us. And now what are they doing? They're looking back and saying, oh, if we could only go back to Egypt. Were they remembering the ways that God provided for them? Did they at any point here remember that as their captors were coming upon them, that God collapsed the Red Sea on them to protect them? Did they remember that God provided for them food and water? Did they remember that God was uh, a fire by night and a cloud by day? He would uh, lead them himself. Did they remember any of that? No. All they remembered was, well, we ate meat in Egypt. It causes amnesia. You see, when you grumble, you blow right past the, the, the past. You ignore, dismiss all of the good things God and others have done for me, and we exaggerate whatever is difficult in my life. That's what complaining does. You forget. I, I have, I've said it many times, I encourage you to get it. It's called a gratitude app. And on my worst day, I, I put a minimum of three things I'm grateful for on this app. Because it's so easy to just focus on the negative. Our human nature just wants us to veer. I heard a quote once, to, to drift is hell, to steer is heaven. It's so easy to go evil, to go negative. Evil complaining is contagious, and evil complaining is destructive because it causes amnesia. Evil complaining is destructive because it's also self-focused. All you think about is yourself. Evil complaining is typically centered on what is currently making me unhappy, right? That's why I'm complaining. I don't like this. I, I, I. It's self-focused. Jesus came to serve. He washed his disciples' feet, even the, the one that would betray him, even the one that would walk away from him, which they all did. He washed their feet. And he says, I have done this for you as an example of what you should do for others to wash their feet. When we're complaining, we're not washing feet, are we? No. We're focused on ourself. What's making me unhappy? And we blow by all the good things in our life. 
And there are good things, even in the darkest days. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, yes, there's bad news. You know, sometimes it goes good news, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, good news, bad news, bad news, bad news, good news, good news. But it always ends with good news. Always. Always with Jesus it ends with good news because when and if we were to die, we would be with him forever. Seeing love face to face. With Jesus, it always ends with good news. That's evil complaining. But what is good complaining? Also called lamenting. You see, the writer of Lamentations said, Arise, groan in the night. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. It also says, With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. Who, who do you cry out to? The Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord, not to others. See, the Israelites complained in front of their tent to each other. They talked about God. Lamenting is talking to God. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. See, what is a lament? A lament is when you're just real honest with God about how, how much you're hurting and how unjust things seem to be at the moment. It's when you're just painfully honest. But with it, there's always a hope that in the end, God is going to make things right. That he will give you a hope and a future. And if it's not in this life, it will be in the life to come. But we have that assurance. You see, good complaining is done in prayer to God's face. See, people were typically on their knees when they're lamenting. And in good complaining is productive. Evil complaining is done in their tents, in isolation or in groups. Evil complaining is done behind God's back. Evil complaining is destructive. See, let's see what Moses, how Moses handled it. Moses heard the whining. All those families whining in front of their tents. And God's anger blazed up. Moses said that things were, uh, Moses saw that things were in a bad way. And Moses said to God, who did he say it to? To God. Why are you treating me this way? What did I ever do to you to deserve this? Did I conceive them? Was I their mother? So why dump the responsibility of this people on me? Why tell me to carry them around like a nursing mother? Carry them all the way to the land you promised to their ancestors. Where am I supposed to get meat for all of these people who are whining to me? Give us meat. We want meat. I can't do this by myself. It's too much, all these people. If this is how you intend to treat me, do me a favor and kill me. <laughs> I mean, talk about being blatantly honest. I've seen enough. I've had enough. Let me out of here. See, Moses got one thing right. He didn't complain about God. He complained to God. He was honest about how he felt. And he did it to God's face, not behind his back. See, God can work with good complaining, but evil complaining? See, lamenting you're in God's face, or good complaining you're in God's face, evil complaining you're talking to one another, you're in front of the tents, you're in groups, and it's contagious, and it's destructive, and it's evil. And see, here, here we are. A lot of our society right now, we're in the land between. And it's so easy when you're in the land between, in that 
that space that's difficult. It's so easy to want to gather around those that are like you. And you create strongholds. Strongholds, these areas of defense. Because the whole world's shifting, so I'm going to gather with everyone that's just like me. And we close ourselves off to the rest of the world. But church, what if we were different? What if we continued to let our light shine? Didn't hide it under a stronghold or a bushel, but we let it shine. We let it shine into the dark pockets of our culture. And we were not people of complaint. Man, what would, what, what would the world think if there was a group of people that they didn't just complain, but they actually prayed for others. They actually loved others unconditionally. That's what God's looking for. It's so easy to just complain amongst ourselves, but to really take it before the Lord, the things that are unjust in our world. That's why it's so important that we pray for James and Valia and their family, for the people of Ukraine. Not complain about it to each other, but take it to the Lord. See, the psalmist took so many things to the Lord. The sorrow, anger, fear, longing, confusion, desolation, repentance, disappointment, depression. See, all of those things he lamented before the Lord. And was David in a season of the land between? Yeah. He was hunted by Saul, yet promised to be king. He's not where he was. He's not a shepherd boy anymore, and he's not where he's going to be. He's not king. He's stuck in the middle being hunted by a madman. But he never forgets. And this is a man after God's own heart. He cries out to the Lord, his deliverer. Even when his own men wanted to kill him, it says he took strength in the Lord. What an example for all of us. Psalms also says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't say, though I walk around the shadow of death, uh, though I get out of the shadow, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Would you just bow your heads for a moment? This, just today, I want to pray for you. See, I believe that God gives us things to learn in the land between. I think he grows things in the land between. And he wants to grow you. He wants you to mature in Christ. And there's hardly any better place to do it than the land between. It's almost like he's resetting your vision from the, the way it used to be to the way it needs to be. And I recognize that today there's probably a lot of you in the land between. And I want to pray for you today that you would receive God's grace, that he would speak to you, you would hear his voice, and you would be obedient to do what he says to do. If that's you today and you just need prayer because you're in the middle of darkness, you're in the land between, just raise your hand. If that's you, I want to pray for you today. Father, you see these hands that are, are raised up. God, I pray that we bring it before you, God. 
We're not going to complain to our coworkers. We're not going to complain to our spouses. We're not going to complain to our friends. God, we bring it to you. And we ask you to be with us, to teach us what we need to know in the land between. Lord, I pray that you would grow healthy things and good things, Lord, in their lives. You have a plan and a purpose for them. But first, they have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God, give them the courage and the strength to do so. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and empower them to do what you've called them to do. We need your strength, God. We need your joy. And so we ask for it now in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Let's stand and worship together.